You know, I blame it on the uniforms. And I know they've worn these things on Friday nights and even special occasions. But did they have to turn into the Devil Rays? As in the actual Devil Rays? Uh, first game of the American League series. This wild card series against the Texas Rangers in game one. Looked like every game that they had in the playoffs a year ago against the Cleveland Guardians. Only worse, all this momentum, as Mark Tompkin wrote, you know, you go through an entire season, and it was a hard grinding season, right? 99 games they won. They lost so many frontline players, so many pitchers. Shane McClanahan, three-fifths of their rotation. Brandon Lau, like all these guys, right? But they grind out a 99-win season, and that's not enough because the Baltimore Orioles were just a little bit better after a horrific July. And then you go out there in front of a mm, not sellout crowd. We'll get to that in a minute because people are really chirping about that. Only 19,000 and change. And you absolutely play, at least from what I saw, and I didn't watch all 162, maybe, maybe the worst game of the season. Like, you could not have gift-wrapped a game better than, than the Rays did in game one of this series. And by the time you hear this podcast, if you play it, I don't know, tomorrow or this evening or whatever uh, on uh, you know on Wednesday after, say, 5 o'clock, their season may be already over. I mean, this is how quick this can end, as it did a year ago. And that's the thing, man. It's like the Rays lose 4 to nothing in their, in their wild card opener to Texas. And to say they didn't play Rays baseball would be an understatement. I mean, check this out, okay? It started with Tyler Glass now. And I think the reason why Tyler started this series is for exactly, you know, because of what happened. That if he wasn't on and he didn't win the game, that Zach Eflin, who's been way more consistent, could save the day. And that's what that's what Eflin has to do today. He has to bail them out of this 0-1, you know, deficit that they've started. And so, you know, now you have a situation where Glass goes out there, and he just – he wasn't sharp. Like, he battled, okay, but in the end, he walked five. He threw a wild pitch that, you know, that scored a run. He gave up only six hits over five and in, in change innings. But all four runs were attributed to him while he was on the mound, and he didn't get any help at all, none, either at the plate or certainly in the field. Um, and meanwhile, Jordan Montgomery for the Rangers just bottled up the Rays offense or what there is of the Rays offense. And we'll get into that because this is now a thing for the Rays. It's a mental block for the Rays in the postseason. It just is. And there's all the evidence to that. Um, but when you have what is usually good, you know, gloves out there in the field and they make four errors three in the first couple innings, and you dig a hole like that, I mean, it's, it's tough to come back. And Kevin Cash was sort of beside himself. I mean, he said it. he doesn't remember them even playing a game. You play 162 games. He couldn't remember them playing a game like that in a really long time. I mean, you do have them throughout the sick course of six months in a season. But uh, you can't do that on the first game of, of the AL wild card. And so – you know, with Glass now, I just felt like the guy's, what, 6'8", <laughs> and he's got a lot of moving parts, and there's good glass and there's bad glass. And this this was sort of in between, but he never really had command. It, it felt like from the first pitch he was pressing, you know, uh, yanking the ball a little bit, um, you know, didn't have command of the fastball. And as good as his breaking stuff is, and they came up there and they were swinging at balls that were, were clearly not strikes, and they were getting themselves out early. And then I think they got, you know, got a little smarter and made him pitch a little bit, and that's when the walk started happening and, and they started getting more base runners. But to start with, he was either too amped up. I wonder what the bullpen was like because when he got on the mound, he just looked like he was tight as hell. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just not what you need from, from a guy that you're going to put out there in game one of a three-game series. And so, 
you know, despite coming into this series, having won, you know, four out of five, um, they had no momentum at all. And they were counting on Glasnell to, you know, to get them off to a good start, to be dominant like he needed to be. And, you know, so it could have been worse, to be honest with you. They got out of some jams. And I thought that a couple things that showed up. One was Jose Siri, who was on the playoff roster, kind of a last-minute decision. He was the guy coming off the injured list uh, with the fractured right hand back in September 11th. So not only did Surrey look shaky in the outfield. Now, this is a guy, he didn't play, you know, there was no rehab game, right? Minor leagues are over. There was no uh, ramp up for him. Just off the DL, hadn't played in almost a month, and you put him in center field in the first game of the playoffs. Should give you a boost. It was just the opposite, right? He loses one deep to center field. It was ruled a double, but basically he misplayed it off the heel of his glove. Again, guy hasn't been out there, hasn't played, right? Um, then he compounded another play in center with, with an error, a throwing error after, after kicking it up in the air. But the biggest thing that told me he wasn't ready to play, and this is something that, I don't know, Kevin Cash will probably disagree. They said that I heard before the game that they watched him swing the bat a couple of times, um, you know, before they decided to put him on the roster and that he had no pain and no problems. But all I know is this, is that he came up with runners on first and third and one out. Now, this is a dude, right, that's second on the team with 25 homers and missed a month. Hell, he might have won the home run title, you know, for the Rays this year. And so he comes up there and he squares the bunt. And I, I either bunted foul or, or it was a strike or whatever, but he didn't put it down. Usually when you do that with a run on first and third, you give that away, that's it. The play's over, right? You're not going to put it on again. Kevin Cash did. Kevin Cash ordered him to bunt again, and this time he popped it up sort of, you know, to the right side of the mound, close to the baseline, to be honest with you. And you got to credit Montgomery because – and at this point, he knows he's squaring, so he's coming off the mound hard. But Montgomery makes a sliding catch. This is one of the best one of the best plays of the day. And they get out of the inning uh, when uh, Rene Pinto strikes out with with uh, first and third and, and uh, two outs. So that just told me that like Cash didn't have confidence. Now Surrey's a strikeout guy. You got a runner on third. It's a one nothing game. We could try to tie it up right there. That was always a good play for Joe Madden. It's it's unstoppable if you just get the ball down, right? But he couldn't do it. He popped it up. And I just wonder how much of that, especially when he put it on the second time, you'd already shown it. So when you lost the element of surprise. But when you did it a second time, it, it kind of told me that, you know what? Cash isn't real sure about him swinging a bat right here. You know, whether it's, whether it's a pain thing, whether it's just, you know, he just hasn't done it. Um, he thought he had a better chance, a guy with 25 home runs, had a better chance of driving in the run with a bunt, sacrifice bunt, than he would swinging away, uh, which is weird. The only guy in this lineup, I think, that does not tighten up in these situations is Randy Rosarena. Randy Rosarena has had the clutch gene since the time he put on a raised uniform. All the home runs in the postseason, you know, going through uh, to the World Series that year. Uh, and he continues, you know, to be just that guy, just, you know, th that's going to deliver. And first time up, line drive single, you know. Um, second time, uh, I think it was second time up or third time up, uh, I believe he doubled. Um so he swings the bat, but the rest of them can't do it, you know, just just cannot come through. It, it was frustrating. If you're a Rays fan and you went to this game, one of the few of you that did, 
Um, there were some, there were some, from what I could tell, broadcasters made mention of this, some cat calls going on. I mean, the fans were upset. Like, this was a poor product at the biggest game of the season, the postseason. You wait all year for October, right? It's all about October. And the funny thing is, and not so funny thing is, is that you began the season and it was vowing not to repeat what happened against the Guardians a year ago, right? When they had that game that they went 14 or 15 innings without scoring a run, scored only one run in the entire series, and that came like in the fifth inning of game one. They were out of that series pretty quickly. And so... It was to me. It was a little like, and this may be a bad comparison, but to me, it was a little like the Tampa Bay Lightning the year that they won the Presidents' Cup, and they go to play Columbus, and they're up a couple goals in the game one. They end up losing that one. They lose the next one. They get swept in four games, and then the next year, it was. It didn't matter what you did in the regular season. It's like we got to get back to that point, right? We got to get back to the point where we lost to Columbus, and never let that happen again. Advance in the playoffs, do a better job on defense, all that, and they did. They won the Stanley Cup. In fact, they won two in a row and went to three. But for the Rays, this was all about erasing last year. You know, the whole 99 win thing, phenomenal, you know, 13 and 0 start, whatever it was. The the enduring, you know, the injuries and and the suspension of you know Wander Franco, their best player, going through all of that and still manage, managing to you know win the American League East because Baltimore had such a great year, but hosting a playoff game against a Texas team, by the way, who led their division for like 161 days, uh, but then lost and had to go from Seattle and fly five and a half hours, pretty ticked off that they were even playing in this series. And they're able to go out there and put together a better effort than you did if you're the Tampa Bay Rays. I'm telling you, if you're a Rays fan, I I, I can understand how frustrating this had to be. Um and and they, they collapsed in every way you can collapse. They didn't seem ready to play. Or if they were ready to play, the moment was too big. And that just should not happen because a lot of these guys have playoff experience. Now, some don't, right? Um, but defensively and pitching, if you can't pitch and play defense, and the Rangers are a much better defensive team than people give them credit for. They're like one of the best in, in the American League, I believe. But and they made some great plays in the outfield, different places. But if you can't pitch and play defense for the Rays, then you have no chance because we know in the postseason they don't score a ton of runs. In fact, they don't score any runs. And this is the thing: you go back to last year. It's incredible to me. You go back to last year in that wild game two of that series with the Guardians. And they only scored one run in the series. But if you combine that with what happened on, you know, in Tuesday's game, that's 27 postseason innings, not outs, 27 postseason innings without a run. 27. Going back to the first two losses to Cleveland in game one of last, you know, last year's wildcard series. I mean, yo, <laughs> you got there. That is not an aberration. That is not because the Guardians and, in this case, the Texas Rangers have the best pitching in Major League history. I mean, that wasn't Bob Gibson out there, okay, or Sandy Koufax. Like, this was somebody they, they see and have seen for the Yankees for something. Now, he threw a hell of a game. Don't take it away from him. But these guys were tight, and they were tight in the field, and they were tight at the plate. Like, I know you've had injuries, but you did win 99 games. Loosen up, man. Like, Kevin Cash, I don't know what he has to do. He goes full Bull, bull Durham on him after the game and, you know, throws the bats in the shower or whatever and starts yelling, you know, you lollygag the first. Like, what does that make you? Lollygaggers. I don't know what he does to shake this up. But if they don't get looser than they were in game one, uh, this series will be over before they hit the pillow a second night. It'll be over. And that's a shame because this was a resilient 
Rays team. I mean, that's the one thing you say about them is, man, they're damn resilient. Damn resilient. All the stuff that they have been through, all the injuries that they have had, to be in this situation and have an opportunity to be hosting a, a playoff series and do what happened to them in game one, now it's an elimination game, period. You know? Period. And there's no margin for error. You know? Glasnow was talking about how he was just getting ahead of himself and the only thing that was really working was the fastball. Well, he, fastball command I didn't think was that great. Struggled a little with the slider. Curveball was a mess. I mean, just you name it. They they did not have any facet of their game working other than, you know, Randy Orozarena, who who managed to bang out a couple hits. I don't know, man. Uh, do I feel you know you're you're only as good as today's starting pitcher, and Zach Eflin is that guy, right? He he's been the guy for them all year long. And that's why they have them in this situation because they felt like, all right, if we get bad glass or we don't get a good good outing from glass now, at least we can come back and he can stem the tide. And that's kind of the position they put him in, you know. And glass now even said it like, that's the guy you want if if the season's on the brink. He said glass now said that's everything. He's awesome. He's been amazing this year. He always comes up in big games, and I'm very confident. And it should be, except for the fact that he's not swinging the bats. If Eflin can hit, then I recommend they do, do away with the DH because no one's scoring runs on this team. 27. 27 straight innings in the postseason now without scoring runs. That, my friends, is not an aberration, a coincidence. That's sort of their DNA. That's why the Rays haven't gotten out of, you know, they've they made it to the World Series twice and lost, but they can make it to the playoffs every year, and then then what? Do they have the lineup? Do they have the superstars? You know, I'm watching, uh, and I don't know the score as, as I do this podcast, but I'm watching the Phillies, right? The Phillies came out of nowhere last year, and they got you know guys making tons of money, Bryce Harper and, you know, Swami, all, all, just all these different dudes. But by God, no matter what happens, they're loose. Like, they play loose, right? They play aggressive. They play free. Man, I see these guys up there, and I'm surprised the bats aren't turning into sawdust at this point in their hands. Like, they are squeezing it so tight. Loosen up. Easy to say, hard to do. I get it. But, like, you got to start having fun, man. Or, or all these six months, the 99 wins, all of that could be all for naught after just two games in the postseason. So I want to I want to get to what is going to be a topic on talk radio and, you know, those who – and look, I, I did talk radio, so I, I know the drill. So it's kind of like the easy show to do, right? Well, I'm just going to mention it a little bit because I have some some thoughts about it, and that's the attendance or lack of attendance at this game. And – uh We'll get into that in just a second. But first, I want to tell you guys that you know it's still hurricane season, right? That thing's not over yet. But there's still time to keep the power on without breaking the bank. And that's getting solar battery backup power from May Electric Solar. Now, with solar battery backup power, there's no fuel cost. There's no loud generator noise. There's no annual maintenance cost. Plus, May Electric Solar offers a 15-year warranty. Now, solar battery backup can save you hundreds of dollars each month. And if you lose power, a generator could cost over $2,000 a week just to keep your house running. New solar battery backup systems qualify for a 30% tax credit, and you get to add a battery to your existing Enphase solar system. Trust the pros in solar. To learn more about May Electric Solar Battery Backup or to get started, call 727-819-2862 or visit mayelectricsolar.com. All right, so the, the loss is one thing, and maybe by this afternoon it's forgotten and we're headed towards a winner-take-all game three to see who gets to play the Baltimore Orioles come up here uh, in the next uh, in the divisional round. Let's talk about what everybody's going to make a lot a big deal about. And maybe they should or not. I I think it's easy fodder, quite frankly. But 
The game drew only an announced crowd of 19,704. And other than the pandemic, which impacted, you know, who could come to the games and stuff like that in 2020, that is the smallest crowd for a postseason game since the 1919 World Series. Now, I don't remember the 1919 World Series. That may shock some of you, but I don't. Uh, I know that in 1918 there was a pretty big flu that killed a lot of people, but whatnot. Okay, so that's a damn long time, right? But I'm not surprised. And people are trying to – I saw somebody that's kind of prone to, you know, his own biases or whatnot saying, well, that's – that's why. See, this is why it needed to be in Tampa, and I can't believe that the people would give these owners any money because, dang it, you know, uh, that's you know, you have this thing in St. Pete, and that's all you're going to draw, and it's because it's in. Stop it, okay? Stop it. There's not, there's not another five or ten thousand people walking the streets of Tampa that would have just rolled up into the, into the new stadium in Ybor City because they live close by and gone to that game. If you were going to go to that game and you're from Hillsborough County, you'd gotten your butt in your car, you'd have driven across that bridge like the 19,000 or so managed to get there, and you'd have been at the damn game. That's a bunch of crap, okay? Is it? Is there more population on this side of the bay? Yes, I was born in St. Pete, grew up there. I live in Hillsborough and have for a long time now, okay, for 20-something years. But I'm here to tell you, it wouldn't stop me. We've had, we've done these stadium shows. Oh, the drive is too far. Oh, the bridge. Oh, St. Petersburg. Stop it. You know what? That team is staying in Tampa Bay because they got a deal. They didn't get one in Hillsboro because Hillsboro is not interested in ponying up any money for the Tampa Bay Rays, or they would have done it. You know, Ken Hagen, all those guys, I like them, but you know what? You never had a financing plan, man. And the Rays took what was a development deal as much as anything that they're part of. And they managed to, you know, they managed to, to execute what will be a, hopefully a, a, the construction of a new stadium and a lease. It wasn't happening in Hillsborough. Hillsborough had what? Eight, 10, 12, 20 years. How many years could they, they we've always known when the lease is up at Tropicana field. We've always known when the shovels have to go on the ground. They didn't get it done, people. Okay, so you, you know, those of you who continue to harp on this and the horse is dead have to realize that it's not a Tampa versus St. Pete thing. That's not why there were 17,700 or 19,704 in the trop. There were 19,704 in the trop because it was a Tuesday game at 3.08 p.m. And those times were just announced a couple days ago, I believe. And every game they pay, play in this series is at 3.08 p.m. Because TV's not interested. They've got other series that they would rather sell to the rest of the nation. Now, I think the Dallas market's a pretty big one. But Tampa is not. Not relative to some of the other markets that are playing later games. And so, if during school year... Right? On a Tuesday at 3 o'clock. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm going to a game, I'd like my kids to go, and they're in school. And I can't get them out. And they might be involved in activities too, but if it's a night game, you've got a chance. You don't have a chance at 3.08 in the afternoon. Hell, a lot of business people can't get off at 3.08 in the afternoon to go see this game. So the time, as much as anything, had something to do with it. And then you say, well, if it's anywhere else in St. Louis, or yeah, okay. That's possible. That's possible. And, you know, the trap may not be that desirable to watch a game in. I, I happen to have no problem with it. But it's just so simplistic to sit there and, and, and tell other people how they should spend their money. Right? This is what you should do. This, if you, you're bad fans if you don't go. Really? Are they bad fans? Maybe they just couldn't go. And it's not about because it's in the trop or, you know, instead of Ybor City or someone. It's just it's Tuesday afternoon at 3.08. And today will be Wednesday afternoon at 3.08. And if they win that, it'll be Thursday afternoon at 
I guarantee you, I'm, I'm well, guarantee, I can't guarantee anything, but I, I'm pretty damn sure that if that game was played at even at, I don't know, 7 o'clock or 7.30, you'd have had a much different outcome in terms of in terms of attendance. I really do. It's just the way it goes. And is it embarrassing? Yeah, it looks bad. It definitely looks bad. But that doesn't mean when they build a smaller, newer stadium, and by the time everything downtown is developed around there, um, that they're going to draw 19,000. I don't know how big the new stadium will be. I would I would suspect it's probably not going to be more than 30,000 that will hold that. And they had the ability to open up you know, the 300 level and stuff like that and expand. I think the, the max might have been around 30,000 if they'd have sold everything out. Um, so they were definitely shy of that. But let's not be naive to the fact of when this game was. You know, Major League Baseball had a lot to do with why there was only 20,000 people. There were less than 20,000 people at this game. So I uh, got news for you. After today, there may not be anybody going to the Trop uh, for six months because their backs are to the wall. Let's see if Zach Eflin can can keep them in this thing. And the thing is, is that the Rangers, they could have blown them out. I mean, like it was a 4 to nothing game. Probably should have been about eight or nine to nothing. I mean, the Rangers did not hit with men in scoring position for the most part. Uh, you know, there's there was one inning it was like bases loaded walks or, you know, nobody out and the Rays managed only to give up one run. So it like I said, it could have been a lot worse, but they weren't ready to play. And the guy that wasn't ready to play the most is a guy who hasn't played, and that's Jose Surrey. And I think maybe they rushed him back a little bit or expected too much but it seemed like the ball kept finding him uh and he just wasn't either defensively or offensively sort of in that mode where you know where he needed to be for a playoff game I mean playoff games you know they're different because it's you know if this was one of 162 you flush it down the toilet no one cares you come back out tomorrow and it's no big deal but in the postseason every at bat matters every pitch matters and now every game matters and you're facing elimination you're facing the end of six months of really hard work of going, you know, to not in in about 48 hours. And so that's a tough place to be. Um, and that's where the Rays have put themselves. Doesn't mean the series is over. Doesn't mean that Zach Eflin can't go out there and win it today. And, and maybe they bash out a bunch of hits and they swing the bats. But they're going to have to get this out of their heads because they're not scoring runs, and not just for a little while, but for 27 innings now and counting. And they will always be counting in the postseason. What if they go through another postseason with no runs? Do you do anything different? Do you change anything about who you have in your lineup? You need some guys to do some stuff in the postseason, don't you? So it's going to be an interesting game. All right. Uh, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about – we didn't get into this the other day. We had a chance to talk to Todd Bowles after the Bucks game, and uh, that was on Monday after they beat New Orleans, and also talked with Dave Canales. And check this out on TampaBay.com and in the Tampa Bay Times, a story that I wrote um, about Canales in this game. And, and I'll tell you, I think that the guy – and I've kind of been critical of them because, you know, they insist on running the ball and they can't run the ball and they're last in the league in rushing average going into this game. And Dave Canales was brought here to do that. But, you know, Baker Mayfield said all week, we need to be more aggressive. And what we took that to mean was maybe early in downs and things. All I know is this, that when the game changed, it changed because they drove the ball 87 yards in the second quarter. It took 17 plays, almost nine minutes off the clock. But I'm telling you, Canales had those guys not having a clue on defense what was coming at them next. I mean, they didn't know what hit them. And it, the creativity was the thing. Um, if you count Baker Mayfield, who touches the ball on every play, eight different players touched the football, seven others on offense besides Mayfield, including – Chris Godwin, who not only caught three passes on the drive, he also threw the first pass of his NFL career. I mean, they they had rollouts, they had shuffle passes, they had end arounds, they had that you know gadget play uh, to Godwin, who you know tried to hit Trey Palmer. And he, and I'll say this about Godwin, he you know 
ball nose ball. Like he's out there in practice throwing it around. So you can know he could throw it. But he made a smart throw because Palmer was actually covered up pretty good. And so he tried to throw it back shoulder where the defender couldn't come through him to get it. Um, and the pass was incomplete, but it was, it was kind of next level quarterbacking, to be honest with you. Uh, that's how smart of a player Chris Godwin is and how aware he is. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the drive ends with Baker Mayfield getting the crap knocked out of him, getting bent backwards, um, a late hit, but he flips a little four yard touchdown pass to Kate Otten. And that drive, the creativity, um, the utilization of all their players showed me the most I've seen from Dave Canales because these guys have been committed to the run almost ad nauseum. Remember he said, I think last week that, you know, how he didn't care he was going to continue to run the ball and, and he's going to be stubborn about it. Well, they're stubborn and then they're stupid, right? Like you, you, you can't just beat your head against the wall if you're not making yards. Well, he ran the ball, but he did it a different way, Right. He did it a different way. He did it with all the all the different reverses, and he used other players besides Rashad White, or in this case, Keyshawn Bond was running back number two. Um, he used everybody. You know, he used Devin Tompkins on reverses. Uh, you know, he he just he found a way. Chris Godwin ran it once. He found a way to to get balls in the playmakers' hands in the run game that wasn't just running backs, and. You know, Canales said, like it. You know, it also does another thing. It stimulates your team, and what I mean by that is, when you practice, like you can't just trot out these plays and that you've not worked on, right? So you have to practice them. Well, that gets guys' interest. You know, if I'm not a dude like I'm not Mike Evans or I'm not Chris Godwin, I'm, I may not get many reps in practice. I may not get might not get the ball very much. But if you've got plays in there for me, like actual plays, like. Shuffle passes and end arounds and things like this. Hey, man, I am going to be focused and engaged in practice like nobody's business because I'm getting the football. And the the thing that people miss, I think, because it's you know we all know about Mike and we know about Chris. These other receivers, like these, were really good players. You know, I mean, Trey Palmer. I still don't know how he lasted till the sixth round. I mean, the guy, you know, ran a four three four. 40 at, at the combine, he's over six something feet, feet tall, set up school record at Nebraska in receiving. I know they didn't throw the ball a whole lot in Nebraska over the years, but he still set the record in one season there, former LSU kid. He had two touchdowns in preseason, and then he, you know, catches the fade for a touchdown against the Saints. And Devin Tompkins, from the first day he stepped in there as an undrafted free agent, this guy. All he does is make acrobatic plays. You talk about competing. You know, you talk about you compete for the football. You try to get it at its highest point. He has about a 40-inch vertical leap. And I'm telling you, he's freakish as an athlete. And he's he's quick. He's explosive. And the touchdown he makes just lays completely out for it on kind of a scramble drill and makes just an incredible catch and manages to keep his feet or the ball across the goal line, you know, for a touchdown. They got Rakim Jarrett is another guy that – uh that can pick up the slack. They had seven catches between those three guys for 54 yards, but two touchdowns, right? And like Canales was saying, he's like, with Tompkins, you put him in there, and he's so sudden, and he's so quick. He goes, it's kind of like the ball finds energy. Like, you know, if you're playing pickup basketball and there's a fast break, if one guy is running the lane really hard, he's going to grab your attention, you know? And it's sort of like that with route runners. Like you come off the ball and you're running that hard, the quarterback's gonna gonna you know get a feel for that, gonna glimpse that as he's going back and making his reads, and the ball is probably gonna find you. Uh, and that's what happened to Devin Tompkins. So I I thought it was a masterful game that Canales called, and they were smart to play these young guys. Of course, they sat you know most of their starters in the preseason, but they were smart to give a lot of reps. Uh, to the Rakim Jarrett's and and Palmers and such, because those guys are going to be needed, and we don't know what Mike Evans' an, uh, hamstring situation will be. I think it was a tweak, not a not a strain or, or or anything like that. So he's got some time to to rest up. But even if he doesn't, you suddenly now feel really confident in the guys that are you know behind their starters, and and you really should feel confident about it because uh, they've done a hell of a job. All right, uh, there's also a story in there 
uh, in the Tampa Bay Times and on TampaBay.com about Luke Gedeke. We'll get into that maybe a little bit later in the week, but uh, Gedeke has made a terrific transition to right tackle, which is his natural position at Central Michigan. Uh, that's where he started. Of course, they had him at left guard as a rookie. He wound up losing that job, also got hurt. But uh, you know, with Worfs moving to left tackle, that's what you know cre- created opportunity for Gedeke to move back to his natural position at right tackle. And those two guys, Worfs and Gedeke, are, are tremendous friends. They push each other in the weight room. Um, it's a really good story, and of course, they're all led by an offensive line wannabe, the Pied Piper, Baker Mayfield, who kind of you know trots trots around with those guys, and rightfully so. But uh, you know, Gedeke did a heck of a job, really, against the Saints, and I think he's ranked like Pro Football Focus does these grades, and I believe he's ranked twentieth among tackles. But that's not that's among all tackles, not just right tackles. So you're talking about you know, if there's two on a team you know, then you're in that, you're in that group of, you know, 10 or so pairs that, uh, that are the best in the game. So it's pretty good for, for what Luke has done, um, to shake off what was really just kind of a bad year for him. And, you know, got a lot of, you know, he was the butt of a lot of jokes and punchlines and, and all that stuff. And, and now he's punching back. So, uh, it's really been, really been fun to watch. All right. Um, so game two today, <laughs> see if the Rays can break that scoreless streak with Zach Eflin on the mound. They might not meet, need too many runs, but the Rangers are capable of putting up a lot of runs. This is it. This is an elimination game for the Tampa Bay Rays. Can they stretch this to a three-game series and then hope uh, that they can find their way to the next round against the Baltimore Orioles? Uh, or will they die another quick death in, in, in the wild card round as they did to the Guardians a year ago? Um, season's on the line man and those guys got to swing the bats and loosen up loosen up a little bit and just kind of go out there and have fun but uh, they didn't have any fun in the field on the mound or at the plate um, certainly in game one all right thanks for listening uh for steve burstick i'm rick stroud the tampa times have a great day everybody